Hello everyone and welcome back to Wonderland Explorers. Today we are in Savannah, Georgia checking out some very spooky things here in the city. This is the ghost city after all, right? <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna actually check out two very important landmarks here in the city. First up, we're gonna actually look at the original inspiration for Walt Disney's Disneyland Haunted Mansion. You know we had to stop there. We found it on the trolley tour. If you haven't yep. checked that video out, go back and look at it. When we saw this, we were like, we're definitely coming yeah. back to look and visit a little bit more close. Yeah, and I'm gonna see a place where Walt actually stayed. So not only did it inspire the Haunted Mansion, but Walt actually stayed here for a couple nights. So it's gonna be awesome to go see. Then after that, we're also gonna head over to the Sorrel Weed House, which is known to be the most haunted house. Are we sick? I, know. I don't know. It's the most haunted house in all of America. <laughs> Why are we doing this? I don't know. I don't know, but we couldn't resist. I guess we're suckers for punishment. But we're, we're doing the day tour. Yeah. Because, y'all, if we did this at night, yeah. I don't think we would sleep again. For yeah. Another... <laughs> we're, we're more architecture enthusiasts than we are uh, ghost enthusiasts. So these are all going to be historic tours of these places, yeah. haunted by nature. <laughs> Beautiful by design. It's gonna be a good time. You know it's you know you're gonna laugh. Come along with us as we explore. <laughs> We have made ourselves to the beautiful Lafayette Square here in Savannah, Georgia, and located just along this beautiful park is the Hamilton Turner Inn. So if you'd like to come and stay in a very, very historical spot here in Savannah, you actually can stay here at, again, Hamilton Turner Inn. It was built in 1873, so of course after the Civil War. It's second empire style architecturally. So you may actually be familiar with other homes in film, television, that were inspired by Second Empire architecture. The Psycho House, Adam's Family, the Munster's House, you catching the theme here? So usually all like haunted haunted houses, terror film, you know, uh, horror films, whatever it may be, all built and inspired on Second Empire style homes. Now, back in the 40s, the, the, the story goes that uh, Walt Disney actually stayed here for several nights when he was in town. And it is thought to be the inspiration for his Disneyland Haunted Mansion. Which, if you look at the building, you can definitely see it. So, it's, it's pretty fascinating to think that you're standing in front of what became the inspiration for the Haunted Mansion. And we also noted that just down the road here, too, you'll run into Liberty Street, which Walt Disney was planning on building Liberty Street as a tribute to Americana in Disneyland. Obviously, you guys know that got scrapped. Liberty Square was built in Walt Disney World, located in Liberty Square in Walt Disney World, Haunted Mansion. So obviously the Disney World Haunted Mansion was modeled off a different site, different building, uh, but the one in Disneyland architecturally is, is actually inspired from right behind me, the Hamilton Turner Inn, right here in Savannah. Let's, uh, let's kind of walk around it, it's really pretty. So kind of making our way around the front porch of the Hamilton Turner Inn. Just a few interesting things about this site was that the original owner uh, actually was the president of the local electric company. And it, this was one of the first places in town to have electricity inside this establishment. So rumor has it is that folks from all over Savannah actually gathered in front of the house when they were gonna like first turn the lights on because they thought the house was gonna explode. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> and then as far as hauntings, of course, everything in Savannah has some sort of like happy haunt, right? Going with the Haunted Mansion theme. Happy haunt story. Uh, rumor has it that there's a Confederate soldier that actually haunts the halls of this establishment. Um, the, the house was built after the Civil War, so, you know, how could there be a Confederate soldier? Because they say they actually see him in, in, in uniform. Uh, rumor has it that, like, the guy was actually buried underneath the house. So they think that's sort of why he's here. So, there you go. There's your happy haunt if you stay here. You're going to meet a Confederate soldier. We've made our way over a few blocks, finding ourselves now in Madison Square. And right behind me stands the original Savannah Armory. So why is this important? Well, we just checked out Hamilton Turner Inn 
inspiration for Haunted Mansion? Well, you may ask yourself, where, where, does it, where do Imagineers find their inspiration? Well, this building behind me played a big role in that. The biggest college here in Savannah is the Savannah College of Art and Design, and it is a huge funnel for Disney Imagineering. So they offer, they actually offer like theme park production programs where people can learn how to do like production drafting and writing for theme parks. There's obviously animation, all the architecture programs. It's a really impressive school. And this was the original building for the college. This is where SCAD started, right behind me, the Savannah Armory. It's pretty cool. If you guys get to come to Savannah and check it out, definitely stop here. They have a 4D like animated experience that tells you the whole history of SCAD and its background. And I swear you will feel that you are at Disney. Like you can see, you can see the crossover. You can definitely see where they're getting Imagineers out of this college. It's that impressive. And you, if you want to get like some uh, SCAD masterpieces to take home with you, they have a shop here where you can buy original artwork by students. It, it's just a really wonderful site to check out while you're in town. So once you leave SCAD, once you've seen that beautiful display and how they tell their story, which is like very creative, you, you do need to go check it out. You come into the Madison Square, it's beautiful, it's vibrant, dun, dun, dun. and then you also reach the most haunted house in America, and that's where we're going next. The Sorrel Weed House is located here along Madison Square in between Bull and Harris Street. This house is one of the best examples of Regency and also Greek Revival architecture. So if you're a fan of those periods, you'll want to come check out this house. It's, it's really stunning. Now the home was, a, was completed in 1840 for Moxley Sorrel. Moxley Sorrel was a general that served under General James Longstreet in the Civil War for the Confederacy. Uh, interestingly enough, he came home, uh, wrote one of the best accounts of any sort of serving Civil War officer of the war and his experience. It's highly regarded to this day. Uh, also, interestingly, uh, Robert E. Lee actually stopped at this house several times and, and stayed here at the home. So there's tons of history, even outside of the, the American Civil War and the original occupants of this house. Uh, this actually served as the filming scene for the, well, for the opening scene of Forrest Gump, 1994 classic. The bench was located here along uh, Madison Square. And they actually, the, the production crew set up all the cameras and did the shots from the rooftop of the uh, Sora Weed House. It's just really fascinating. <laughs> all right, so obviously there's lots to do when wanting to visit the Sora Weed House. Uh, there's been many production crews that have come here outside of the movies, so uh, Ghost Adventures came here. Lots of paranormal uh, research researchers come here all the time to investigate this house because of its history. There's lots and lots of stories about the number of deaths that occurred here, the grave sites underneath here. It, it's really intense, and so you can see why there's a lot of uh, a lot of interests and a lot of haunts that occur here. So uh, depending on what you want to do though, if you're not really into the ghost tours, they do also offer a daytime architectural and history tour, which is what we're going to go on. It's $12. It's very, very affordable. It runs every hour on the hour. We're going to go and hop on that here in just a second. And then once the evening arrives, that's when they start doing all the ghost tours. And they have several different experiences that you can select from. So if you want to, uh, you know, get your fix, see some ghosts, you can come here at night, have lots of fun, or you could be like us and let's just go check out some history. <laughs> Welcome, my name is Jaren and I'll be your guide for the next 45 minutes. And I'm actually from Alaska, believe it or not. Traded nine months of winter for this, nine months of summer. I was very happy when I took a cold shower on purpose. I am an actor, I got my MFA at the Savannah College of Art and Design, and if you take the white trolley tour, old Savannah tours, you may see me as a character on board from time to time. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So the uh, property was designed and built by uh, Charles Kleski, who designed it for the Sorrell family. It's about 12,000 square feet of property. That includes the main building here, uh, the carriage house, uh, the extension to the carriage house and the townhouse. Now, I just learned recently, not too long, about a, maybe a week and a half ago, 
that may be the original uh, carriage house and this is the extension, but I'm just going to refer to this as the carriage house. So um, many people will describe this house as a Greek revival home. We feel that doesn't do it enough justice at the museum. So we describe it more as a vernacular home, meaning they took inspiration from what was available in the area. So a lot of different designs going on. You will see some Greek revival inspiration. For instance, right now, it appears the house is made out of sandstone, but it's actually um, brick underneath, as you can see exposed over here. They just scored the plaster on the outside to look like stone. We'll see French style porches, mahogany doors, pine floors. You may also see some of the Regency style on the inside of the home with the curved corners. That comes in with the Wheat family later on. Um, and at the end of the tour, you'll see more Greek, Greek inspiration as you leave the tour. So you guys will go out of the front of the building. We do things a little backwards there. Much of what you see will, see our, will be our interpretation of what that time period would have looked like. For instance, this is 1840s, the rest is 1850s. Um, a lot of the furniture and the artwork has been donated to, to us, so it's not original to the home, but it is time period appropriate. The garden, the same thing, so there would have been a lot more herbs and spices, fruits and vegetables, and lots and lots of flowers to keep the smell down. So if you smell the horse carriages going by, I'm sure you have, I know I have, or at least seen them going by, with no automobiles and, no, and all horse carriages, that would be pretty smelly. I've seen horses do their business in the middle of the street, so imagine trying to clean that up with no pavement, uh, pretty smelly. Um, people are only known to bathe about once a week, so that would add to the smell. You might see people walking them around with handkerchiefs and flowers to their nose as they pass by certain people. I think I'm doing okay today. <laughs> uh, the garden would have been covered in dirt, chickens roaming around, and um, the uh, brick that you're standing on is actually original to Savannah, it's called Savannah Gray Brick. It gets its name because of the color that it makes. And it's from the western side of Savannah underneath the plantation that was over there. That is now a paper factory. And certain times of the day or the year, you will smell this burnt toast smell throughout the city for that reason. Um, the clay underneath the plantation was not very good for agricultural use. And so the enslaved people actually formed the brick that we're standing on. It was put into a brick wall down Bull Street, but the wall was destroyed and people were just throwing the brick away. So we've collected it. Now, of course, we can't erase history, but we can do our best to give credit where it's due, and we put it on display for you. Um, there are actually fingerprints all over the place. I always lose here. There's one over here. I always forget where it is. But this one? Yeah, it looks like it probably a little, a little left behind of some of those fingerprints. Um, the oyster shell, also common at the time, that would have been heated up to make lime. Um, added with water, sand, ash, and then reheated, and then when it solidified, it would make a unique style concrete known as tabby, T-A-B-B-Y, like the cat. You can see the storyboard down there if you want to read more about it later. The Owens Thomas house actually has some tabby on display. You'll see a lot of that in the historic district. That would keep the house cool around 70 degrees all year round. So they were pretty uh, innovative how they were able to accomplish um, cooling without any um, air conditioning. The carriage house is, was primarily used as a storage for many years. It was like a garage. So the horses would pull in from the other side of the lane. Uh, when you guys go inside, you'll see the what appeared to be a door on that side. Where that bay window is now, there was a door. You can still see the hinges on either side. Uh, there would have been dirt on that ground as well. Rider would have stayed up above, horses down below. Although the horses may have stayed at some stables at Forsyth Park. Um, depending on what time of the year it was. Now, Oglethorpe was the founder of Savannah. He came in in 1733, placed here by King George to keep Spain from coming in, into the Georgia colony. And while he was here, he thought slavery was an abomination, which of course it was, and he wasn't here for very long. So he went from almost no slavery here in Savannah to having one of the largest auctions, unfortunately. So after he left, they saw how profitable slavery was. So this was then in turn turned into enslaved quarters. And they had about eight to 12 enslaved people on the property at all times, probably filling out the extension over there. Um, the housekeeper would have stayed up above. Um, the property goes from the Sorrell family to the Wee family for about three generations until the grandson loses it during the Great Depression. And then the bank has ownership for a little over a decade until the Cohen family has it from the 1940s to the 1980s. They actually turned the downstairs into a Lady Jane dress department store, 
and they had enough success that they made this into a hair salon. Uh, when you go inside here in a few moments, you guys can feel the wall on the inside. It's going to feel very smooth because it's faux brick painted on plaster, insulating real brick underneath. This is kind of fascinating. Like, this is not the brick. This is what he was talking about. This is all made to look like brick, but you can see this is that, that gray brick that he was referring to, so you can see the blend between those two surfaces. That's really, wow, that's fascinating. So right now, we entered in what would have been the housekeeper's room, so she would have had her own space here in the carriage house. It's a, it's a pretty reasonable size room, but I mean, it's very, it's very basic, even for the time. I mean, but it's definitely an improvement over like the unfortunate kind of bunk situations that are out there, which we'll show you those in just a second. So the space that we're in right now is actually this, what would have been the enslaved quarters, and you notice that the beds that are behind me are very, very, very basic, and they are bunk style. They're made out of wood. Obviously, these are reproductions, but the heat up here is tremendous, and they even have an air conditioner today. It's, I could not imagine what these living conditions were like back in the 1800s. I mean, it's incredible, but oof, my goodness. And Oglethorpe, while he was here, he uh, also didn't want Catholicism, not for any religious reasons. He just didn't want anyone sympathetic to Spain at the time. It was mostly out of paranoia. Also, no hard liquor and no lawyers. Thought they were both problematic. I guess that makes sense. This is the basement level, garden level, street level, whatever you want to call it, would be accurate. Uh, Kluski actually designed this house with the intention of having four rooms on each level. There would have been a wall along here and here. Now, when this was turned into a department store, many uh, mistakes were made, one of which was removing the walls. Those were the load-bearing walls at the time. So the, I believe they went bankrupt in the 1980s, probably for good reason, because if they had stayed, who knows what would have happened. Now, we're trying to do our best to avoid creating future ghosts for future stories, so we are in good hands now. We have new columns and things here. Um, these are 1860s style garments, probably something they wore to bed, um, stitched by candlelight, hand-stitched. Others have pointed out that the stitching is a little too good, could have been commercially done, but the con general consensus is that it is hand stitched. Um, so pretty interesting there. As we move into the kitchen, on the left hand side you'll see Henry Weed's um, tools. He had these in his hardware store. So. So this is our main kitchen where a lot of the food would have been prepped. Um, I can't even imagine all the enslaved people being down here with the fireplaces going in the middle of the summer. It would be horrendous. Um, another mistake made is this is the original flooring. You can touch it if you want to. Um, they poured concrete over the top of it and when the concrete was destroyed, they destroyed the slate underneath. So it would have kept things nice and cool down here. Believe it or not, the brick I think came in in the 1990s or 2000s. I'm not very good at detecting old brick from new, apparently. I guess the 90s are old these days. Yeah, this was the first house built on Madison Square and the largest at the time. And being the color building, the bright color that it was, it probably attracted a lot of attention. Uh, prior to the 1980s and Jim Williams and his famous Christmas parties, this was the place to be. So I don't know if you know Jim Williams and his story, but um, he threw famous Christmas parties. Um, we'll go ahead and head over here. Um, there probably was were archways in these walls to allow for airflow. They would open these doors and those doors uh, for the same reason. You can actually still see original two slabs of the floor where the pinholes are. That's where the doors would have been. And we'll head into the textile room. So this is the textile room. This would have been uh, the room. Some of the guides at night say this is the laundry room. Um, a lot of repairs would have been done in this room, or um, uh, garments made. As you can see, we have our loom, our spinning wheel, and our spinning weasel. Anyone know what a spinning weasel is? So you may have heard of it, whether you know it or not, because it would measure out your yarn, and when you got to your desired length, it would make a popping noise, which is where you get pop goes the weasel. It's pretty fun. Uh, speaking of expressions upstairs, the bedding in the carriage house may have been filled with hay or Spanish moss and that's where you get, don't let the bed bugs bite, bite for that reason. Um, some people carry Spanish moss around their neck. Um, be careful of touching the Spanish moss, you never know. Um, I believe Henry Ford actually filled his cushions with Spanish moss and then they had the, um, the phrase, itching for Ford. So, um, every time I stand behind this desk, I think I'm an 1840s Julia Childs or something. 
So um, silk was a product that Oglethorpe thought would be great to produce in Savannah. He figured we had a similar climate to that of the Mediterranean, which is true, although as you've experienced today, we have a lot more humidity. So domesticated silkworms would take to mulberry bushes. And for every acre of land, he insisted they would plant a mulberry bush. But unfortunately, in the span of 20 years, they only produced about seven pounds of silk, which would have been made into a luxurious dress for Queen Caroline at the time. And that's where you get, um, here we go around the mulberry bush, if you've ever heard that. Mm. What I love about the uh, loom, I believe this loom was actually designed and built by one of our guides, donated to the museum. Um, there's a French style loom called a Jacquard loom, and it had punch cards with punch holes in it. And the threads would go through the holes, making various designs. And that process is what precedes what we know as computer programming today, which I find completely fascinating how history, one idea leads to the next, and who knows where we would be with computers without the loom. So we have our laundry room, our kitchen, our textile room. What do you think this next room would be? Frank Sorel. He is the son of Lucinda and Francis. Lucinda is Francis's first wife. They have three children. He's a very talented surgeon, graduates from Penn University, performs many of his surgeries right here in this room. That's where you hear a lot of the ghost stories whether with all of the amputations that may have taken place. Um, if you were lucky enough to end up on his table, you had a 46% chance of surviving, which is pretty good in those days, believe it or not. He's considered a bit of an adventurer, traveler, moves to California in the 1850s. What was happening in California in the 1850s? Gold rush. Gold rush, so he's making a lot of money. Charges about $10 a visit. Today it would be about $360. So not only is he making a lot of uh, money, he's making a lot of friends. He gets elected to state legislature. When the Civil War breaks out, he actually votes for California to secede. They do not, so he moves to Virginia and joins the Civil War on the Confederate side, becoming a medical director. Uh, he nearly gets promoted Surgeon General, but the war ends before that can take place. On the table here are Revolutionary War bullets that were found on the property in the wine cellar in front of the carriage house. Uh, we cannot go down into the wine cellar. It is a bit of a hazard, and no, there's no wine down there. So um, I've never actually been down there. But SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, was founded in 1978, and one of the first things you can study was historic preservation. You can still study it today. In the 1990s, they found these bullets on the property. Uh, that's because the Siege of Savannah, one of the bloodiest battles of the Revolutionary War, took place on this property. Now, on my ghost tour, I sometimes say they found about 40 bodies underneath this property and about 240 out of Madison Square. Um, and Hurricane Matthew in 2016 actually um, exposed some of those bodies when some of the trees fell over. So they weren't very, very deep, actually. And if you look at these bullets, they appear to not have been fired or hit anybody. They're in pretty good shape. Some medical experts have said those tools are not far off from what we use today, which is a little eerie. Um, although with no anesthetic, that would be even worse. So. Um, when you're ready, we'll start making our way upstairs. You can look around if you want to. Feel free to take photos of the storyboards if you want to read those later. Um, so this is the dining room. If you were a child, you would not have eaten in this room until you had gone through boarding school or etiquette training. Uh, you would have eaten upstairs with the nanny, likely. Now, a lot of people wonder what this dish is. Any guesses? So it's actually where you put your fish bones or chicken bones. Uh, an older lady thought it's where you put your dentures. <laughs> I always think of Molly Brown in Titanic when she says work from the outside in. So that's the order of using the utensils. Uh, this room would have been kept a little bit more private. That's why the medallion's a little bit smaller than the rest in the house. The crown molding is original to the house as well as the cast iron. So a lot of the cast iron was brought in by William Kehoe and his um, iron foundry. He is, he is, um, Start, he was the founder of the Iron Foundry in Savannah, and his home was on Columbia Square, and there's a lot of the iron came from him. Um, ours is original. Some of the historic buildings have wood painted on to look like cast iron. This fireplace, uh, the, our fireplaces have been filled in, so they would have been a little deeper at the time. Um, as you can see, this is the Regency style with the curved corners that comes in with the Weed family. Um, are you guys familiar with the dumbwaiter? Or a dumbwaiter, hopefully not at a restaurant. So if you don't know, it's a pulley system where you transport um, clothing, food, supplies from floor to floor, kind of like an elevator. Um, they would have had one in the basement and it would have come up somewhere between the rooms over here. These doors are original as well. Um, very impressive, single piece of wood split down the middle and steamed and then bent to look the way that they do. 
Behind here uh, would have been the butler's pantry, but today it's actually where we have our Christmas trees. So it's a bit of a storage right now. Um, we're trying to turn this into a bathroom at some point so we don't send our guests across the street anymore. I don't know if you noticed, but the house on the outside is sort of divided into three sections. So we have the corner, and then the middle section, and another corner that mirrors this side. Uh, when the Weed family comes in, they, they install plumbing, and that's where the bathrooms would have been on the corners here. Rooms, this is where a lot of the money would have been shown off. Um, this is the part of the tour where I tell Francis' story. So he has a tragic life pretty much from beginning to end. He's born in Haiti to a Haitian mother and a French father. And because of his European features, he's able to pass off as white, which of course would have been advantageous at the time, but he is considered mixed. Um, his mom dies around the time when he's born. We're not exactly sure how, probably through child labor. Two years later, his dad moves to New Orleans to start a plantation. Um, he abandons Francis and he never sees him again. So he's considered an orphan and um, his mom's family raises him until he's about 11 to 14 years old. He meets the Douglas brothers who own a trading company. They teach him the business. They trade sugar, rum, indigo, things like that. When he's 19 years old, they want to move back to Baltimore where they're from and they invite Francis to come along. He agrees. So they hire a clergyman to teach him English. He only knows French up until this point. While he's there, he meets their niece, Lucinda, who becomes his first wife, as I mentioned, and they have three children. Uh, Lucinda actually succumbs to yellow fever and dies. If you don't know how someone dies in Savannah, the default answer is yellow fever. Um, and he inherits one-seventh of her estate, so she was wealthier than he was at the time. And he joins forces with the Douglas brothers, forming their trading company, and he becomes the third wealthiest man in Savannah. Um, to keep the money into the family, is my assumption, he marries her sister, Matilda. Uh, Matilda, in 10 years, gives him eight children. It's a long time to be pregnant, but it's even longer when you're frowned upon out in public. Pregnant women were not treated very well at that time, and they were caged inside of their homes. So um, if you survive 2020, you might relate to that feeling. So she's hallucinating, <laughs> she's seeing things. They don't have a lot of medical treatment for her. Uh, they had her on opium. I don't have much experience with opium, but I would think that would not make you very stable. Uh, just to be sure, I took some this afternoon, so it might get a little awkward. Um, so she, uh, Matilda, falls off of the second-story balcony, and it's ruled as a suicide. And you might hear her story, whether or not she was pushed by Francis, whether or not there was an affair going on. And if you take the ghost tour, they go into more detail about that. Um, so a lot of the time, he spends his time at the townhouse across the street. And that house was mostly built for his older children later in life, but when tragedy struck, he hung out over there. Um, five of their eight children make it to adulthood, so that adds to their depression, and um, he dies at 77 years old, so not too bad for that time period. When the parties took place, they would have banquet tables, uh, the furniture would be moved, and then at the end of the night, uh, the furniture would be put back, and then they would hang out. Men would be in this room, and women in this room, and we know the difference because the cast iron tells a story. So, we have a woman nurturing her family with angels on either side, uh, women were considered nurturers. Um, and it, we'll look at that one in a moment, but men, uh, a man is protecting his family, men were considered protectors. Um, in this room, we have the largest medallions in Savannah. That one is an original, um, but this one was destroyed and SCAD recreated it over here. So pretty impressive. Uh, we'll move on into this next room. The mirrors um, in those days, very popular to be so big, uh, fill up the room probably to bounce light back into the room as well. Uh, I believe that's an original painting of the Owens Thomas house. My understanding is that's Lafayette on the balcony there giving a speech and the crowd was cheering and roaring the entire time uh, throughout the speech, but afterwards they had no idea what he was saying because it was in French. So, um, over here is a portrait of Gilbert Moxley. He is the half-brother of Frank. Um, and from the Matilda side of the family. He joins the Civil War, becomes Brigadier General. He gets shot twice. First time he's fine, second time he's assumed dead, but he's not, he's just mostly dead. And he writes a book called Recollections of a Confederate Staff Sergeant, and his books are still being used at West Point today for training. Frank actually performs surgery on him, and he becomes Frank's best man at his wedding later in life, which is interesting. Um, one of my friends and co-workers, he actually describes this book um, as a combination of Christian Bale and Ethan Pop. <laughs> um, if anyone wants to, we do invite our guests to play the piano. I can't guarantee it's in tune, but because of the donation, 
we figure pianos are, or instruments are meant to be the business negotiations would have happened in here. Also a lot of drinking. Um, Robert E. Lee was a frequent visitor at the time as well. Uh, behind you there, that dresser appears to be a little awkwardly shaped. Um, excuse me. So, any ideas what might be in this drawer? A setter pan? Just kidding. It's actually uh, a liquor cabinet. Um, no samples. Every drawer looks like it was meant for something a little different. That's why there are keyholes all over the place. Now, a man named Stephen Bader took over the property in the 1990s. He had the intention of turning this house into like scad dorms or apartment buildings, uh, but he thought it was too costly to do so. So he painted it back to its original color, and the city stopped him in the middle of painting it and said, whoa, that looks horrendous, please stop. And he assured them that it was accurate, so they let him continue. I would think that probably was inspired by being from Haiti, that tropical look. Um, if you ask me, it kind of fits in because there's all of this reddish orange brick throughout the city. Um, if you've seen the Forsyth Park Mansion, for instance. But they had to find loopholes around doors and they made these. So you don't want to hear that in the middle of the night. It is starting to rain. I think we're in... Uh, it did start right here originally, but in the 1940s, for some reason, they moved it to the uh, left-hand side. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, and then in the 1990s, they moved it back to where it is. Um, when they did that, they saw this exposed faux wood paneling painted on that is original to the house. So if you want to take your phone out, you can take a closer look. Um, as you can see, they miscalculated and they didn't quite, the second time, make it up to the door. Um, so that's the history to this stairwell. We can't go upstairs, unfortunately, also a bit of a hazard, um, but that's where the bedrooms would have been. They would enter in this way. They would not pass this threshold until they were announced into the party that was common. Um, but with 200 guests, it probably got a little tedious. So instead, they would put a pineapple up on the porch, and that would be an indication you're free to enter as you wish. Um, I don't know if you know, but a pineapple is a sign of hospitality. That's why the Marshall House has it as their logo, and we have sculpted pineapples throughout the city for that reason. Um, at the end of the night, when Mrs. Strell wanted to go to bed, which would have been considered rude, um, instead of announcing to everyone, she would just put a pineapple back on, on the mantle inside and that would let everyone know you don't have to go home, you just can't stay here. Uh, they would open those doors across the way, open these doors, and then they would close these when they didn't want anyone looking in on their party. So you had the coolest part of the house and uh, privacy all at the same time. Uh, the last thing I will tell you is that some of these historic homes have two stairwells at their entrances um, some will say that they were divided by men and women to go down those stairways um, because they didn't want men looking at women's ankles. They thought ankles were considered naughty. Um, others will tell you that uh, they just like symmetry and it looked pretty. So it depends on which house you go to. I'm not sure if it's a myth or not. There's also a stone bench on the sidewalk out in front. That's to step onto carriages as they pulled up. So, um, that's pretty much what I have for you. Um, but thanks for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome to look around or leave with your umbrella. So we just walked out of the Sorrel Weed House. Yeah. This is a very fascinating history. Talk to our, uh, our tour guide. I have to say, like, He's excellent. he was very, very good. We've toured a lot of, like, plantations, historical homes in our life. This one, for me, I, it does feel like, it feels funky in here. There's, there's definitely a vibe in this house. Yeah. So you can come back at night if you choose to. There's yeah. several tours you can take as well. Yeah. But if you're not into it, this is a fascinating tour. You do learn a lot about the time, the period, and the era. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I would give it like a 5 out of 5 for experience. Yeah, definitely 5 out of 5. Fun time. Come out here. Check it out. Like the daytime tour wasn't like... Like I said, there's a vibe in here, but it's not creepy. I, I didn't get like creepy vibe. You're just like looking at some really beautiful architecture, learning some fascinating history. This place is so historical to the area. You just have to come here and do it once. Definitely recommend the uh, the historical daytime tour. If you have the guts, come back and do the one of the nighttime tours. We even learned that over the weekend, they'll even offer like an overnight stay. I, I would never do that. If you guys are into it, God bless you. <laughs> Have at it. Well, everyone, I think that's going to do it for today. We're a very fun day checking out some happy haunts 
yeah. some pro maybe not so happy haunts depending on you know what location we were at a lot of history here in savannah it was a ton of fun yes Whew. i'm glad we didn't see any ghosts yeah me either <laughs> and it's definitely it's a warm one here we just got into a rainstorm so we're gonna make our way out yeah. if you guys like the video make sure to hit like and subscribe and as always till next time friends bye, bye.